Thank you for your confidence, members. Right. We move on to item two, which is the appointment of vice chairman. Are you happy to confirm the appointment of Councillor Morris Byam as vice chairman for the Eastern uh, Committee Council year 2018-2019? Thank you very much. Uh, item three is to confirm the minutes of the last meeting, which have been on the table for the last 30 minutes. Are you happy for me to sign those as a true record? Thank you. Um, Emma, do we have any apologies for absence? Yes, we have apologies from councillors Morris Byam and Liz Townsend. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Uh, prior to the meeting, we have a non-pecuniary interest from Councillor Gray as being a parish councillor and living in Dunsfold. Thank you. Uh, members, does anybody else wish to declare an interest in any of the items for discussion? Thank you. Uh, Emma, any questions from the public? None received. Thank you. Officers, how, do we have any relevant updates to government guidance or legislation since the last meeting? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I just wanted to uh, draw to uh, the members' attention that uh, with effect from the start of June, um, there is the introduction of the new permission in principle uh, regime. Now, myself and Elizabeth will be giving you a fuller briefing paper on that, but effectively it's an alternative route uh, of obtaining planning permission uh, from a normal planning application, which splits uh, the application process into matters of principle, um, so that's uh, location, uh, amount and land use, and technical detail. Um, it's going to introduce some interesting alternative methodologies for us uh, moving forwards in terms of the timescales for determining applications, and clearly it's a means uh, that the government has brought in to try and uh, help accelerate uh, house building on small sites, so it only deals with uh, minor schemes, so up to nine dwellings, and they have to be residential-led. Um, uh, for this point in time, I think it's, it's as well for you to know that we do have this new system being rolled out in June, uh, and as I say, a more, a more detailed uh, sort of update paper will be, will be issued by myself and Elizabeth in, in the coming days. Um, and, um, yeah, we look forward to seeing how it plays out. Thank you, Steve. While you've got the microphone, would you like to go through the performance against government target figures, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so if I take members to uh, page seven, um, it's the usual format uh, and the report for noting. Um, and uh, as you'll see from that, uh, the service's performance in, in respect of speed, uh, we've got you know, excellent performance figures being maintained. Uh, and we've got a rolling period now that we set ourselves. We don't know the next government assessment period, uh, but we're just looking at the period since uh, April 17. And you'll see there that we're you know, well above uh, the targets. In terms of quality, uh, as usual, the non-major um, threshold uh, is nowhere near being breached. And there's an improving position in respect of the major decisions. You'll see that's beginning to fall away uh, from that 10% threshold. Uh, and again, that's, that's uh, uh, the impact, I think, of, of our local plan, uh, you know, giving more uh, support to the decisions that we're, that we're making. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, just a, a note that uh, in the event of site inspections being necessary as a result of tonight's considerations, uh, these will be held on Monday the 18th of June 2018 at a time to be agreed. So we move on to the main item of business this evening, which um, th there are four items, but because they're all interlinked, we are going to take them together. But obviously the, uh, the decisions will be taken separately. Uh, these items B1, B2, B3 and B4, which are reference numbers WA 2018 0170, WA 2018 0171, 172 and 173, all situated at Dunsfold Park, Stovold Hills, Cranley. And I would invite Rachel Kellis to introduce the items to us. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if, if, with your indulgence, I'm just going to uh, Sorry, introduce Elizabeth. Yes, not, yes, not at all. That's fine. Um, good evening, members. Um, I'd just like to set out a few points of context for these applications to assist your consideration. I'll then hand over to Rachel to take you through the main issues. 
Firstly, um, the Dunsfold Park site is clearly well known to you. It has had an extensive and complicated planning history, culminating, of course, in the recent hybrid planning permission granted by the Secretary of State in March for a new settlement. Now, notwithstanding the current challenge of that decision, the permission remains valid and lawful, and the applicants, to my understanding, intend implementing it. The current applications on your agenda are clearly part of the more recent planning history prior to the new settlement application. As members are aware, since Dunsfold Park bought the site some years ago, the Council has granted a number of temporary uses to enable an active business use of the site. These temporary uses have all had the expiry dates of April or July of this year, um, with the expressed intention of um, expiry to accommodate the longer-term use of the aerodrome once the planning policy position had been decided. Clearly, significant progress has been made this year in confirming that policy position through the adoption of the local plan and its inclusion of Dunsfold Park as a strategic housing allocation. The local plan adoption was somewhat delayed by factors such as the timescale of the, the inspector's report. Um, otherwise, the, the long-term position may have been confirmed sooner than February of this year. And I say that because um, I think, in fairness to the applicants, their expectation was that the, the uses would have had enough time on them to um, run their course to align with the, the future use of the site, if that, if that was to take on the shape of... of the housing allocation, which it now will do. So there has been a bit, a bit of a, an overlap whereby clearly the uses have come up for expiry um, prior to the, the final position being resolved and the enabling of the implementation of the new settlement. So they're submitted clearly on the basis of a, a business case that there is an existing business use on the site and as applicants they seek to want to continue those uses pending the, the implementation of the longer term position that's been confirmed through the local plan. Now, as Rachel will explain, the current applications have been submitted to ex effectively extend the temporary business related uses for a period to cover the transition into the new settlement development. The temporary uses have been found clearly previously to be acceptable in planning terms. And I must advise you that it would not be appropriate in my view to revisit the principle of these uses the uses on the site have been proactively monitored and managed through regular meetings with the applicants and um, any use issues um, which have rarely occurred in relation to impacts have been effectively dealt with through normal procedures. Um, the material issues for consideration tonight are in connection with any changes in circumstances since the original permissions were granted and importantly what material effect there will be in combination with any other construction work um, in relation to the new settlement. So I will pass over to Rachel now to take members through those considerations and I hope that's useful context. Thank you very much Chairman. Thank you Elizabeth. Rachel over to you. Thank you very much. But as briefly explained to you by Elizabeth, you've got four applications which are extending four different temporary uses on site. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the site, but just for a memory refresher, this is an aerial view of the application site. You can see quite clearly the track. The temporary uses are focused on use of that track and therefore are focused towards the western end. You'll see the application site also includes a number of industrial business uses and they're focused in the most part towards the northern end. And you'll also note that the application is in close proximity to the A281. I'll take you through a few existing photographs. These show you the perimeter road and track and the main runways. A, fair, a further aerial view for you below. And now turning to the items themselves, starting with item B1, W180170. An application under section 73 to vary two conditions. You'll see that's seeking to vary the time limit, that's to allow the additional three years, and also condition two, which restricts the number of traffic movements. And that's to increase to that same number, the same vehicle cap that was permitted under the 2015 permission, and that was the business permission, which you may well recall. The original permission itself related to, and the activities it relates to, are the continued use of a perimeter track and runway, 
for the evaluation, testing and or filming of motor vehicles for a temporary period. It is sometimes referred to as a Top Gear permission. It's important to note it's, it's not a personal permission, so another company or could go in and use that, but practically it has been referenced in, in that way. Turning to item B2, again, we have an application under section 73A. It seeks to extend the time period condition on that for a further three years, and again, also the traffic movements in the same manner as previously described. The activities concerned are continued use for filming, what you'll see as I go through these applications and the reason for four different plans is you do have four different site areas for each application. You'll see this is quite a, a, a broad site area. If you can see the inner green line, that's this one just here, that denotes the precise area, still quite a large area, where the filming activities would be limited to. Again, you'll see primarily they are still focused ar around the track and its surrounding, surrounding perimeter. Turning to item B3, ending 0172. This seeks to vary the same conditions, that is, the time limit condition and the highway, num the highway movements condition as well. The use that it concerns is the use of part of the perimeter track and runway for driving experience days such as the everyman use. You'll see this is more closely focused on the western part of the track, and that's shown by the outline in red. Finally, item B4, this is the reference ending 0173. This simply, this is only varying the time limit restriction on this condition. There is no highways, highways cap on this condition to vary. The use that it relates to is the continued use of the perimeter track and main runway for driver training and continued sighting of a building for a temporary period. That's the Mercedes McLaren who used that permission. This image shows you that temporary building on site and there are also plans showing you the relevant elevations and floor plan for that building. Now move you to go straight to the determining issues for this application, starting with the matters of principle and technical opinion. In terms of the principle of development and planning history, you know that the principle of development has been established through the original permissions on the site. However, you'll also be aware of the change in circumstances since then, which have been previously described to you by Elizabeth, but they include the adoption of the local plan and the additional permissions on site, most notably the, the new settlement permission. So then the next point is now a strategic allocation. <coughs> and the new local plan does contain two site-specific policies, SS7 and SS7A. Whilst the proposals are for employment uses, these do not strictly fall within the parameters of SS7 policy. However, officers consider that they are nonetheless compatible broadly with the aims of that policy due to their temporary nature and as such no objection is raised regarding a conflict with that policy. Turning to the compatibility of uses including noise impacts. Noise in particular is a matter which our, the Council's environmental health officers have reviewed and considered and have raised no objection to the proposal. In terms of highway safety the current applications, and that is items B1 to B3 only, seek an increase in the maximum number of to total road vehicular movements on any calendar day, and they seek that increase up to 3,348. Whilst this is a change from the original permissions granted on site, the purpose of doing so is to match the higher cap imposed mm. on WA 2015-0695, and that's the more recent business permissions that have been implemented on site. As the increased cap seeks to restrict vehicle movements across the whole site, and not just one single activity, and this would match the conditions imposed on other consents, the proposals do not seek any further increase in vehicle movements over and above the previously permitted for the site. Given that permission, there's no substantive planning application to this aspect, and it's important to note that the County Highway Authority have raised no objection to this change. Turning to the in-combination impacts, 
in terms of the four temporary uses and how they sit with each other, they are already operational on site and have existed together for a number of years. And we have, as a council, previously accepted that in combination with each other, those four uses are acceptable in combination with each other in planning terms. There could be some overlap between the four temporary uses, if extended, up to for a further three years, and the construction of a new settlement permission. This is considered in detail within the relevant technical sections of your report. However, it's important to note that the temporary uses have already been considered in the EIA relating to the main settlement application, where it was assessed on a basis that those uses would continue. That found, subject to mitigation, there would be no significant adverse effects resulting from the in combination impact of both that new settlement and these four uses before you. That leads me on to environmental impact re regulations. The four uses on themselves would not amount to EIA development. I'll take you now to the matters of judgment for this case. Firstly, the impact on the countryside beyond the Greenbelt and area of great landscape value. The siting of the building in respect of item B3 would be acceptable in visual and landscape terms. Officers are satisfied there'll be no visual or landscape harm resulting from the proposals. In terms of heritage impacts, they're satisfied that the temporary uses by their nature would preserve the setting and interest of the listed building and structures on site and would not harm their significance. Turning to the economic impacts, the Council's economic development team have expressed support for the applications and they note that the proposed activities support the local economy and provide valuable employment and industry in the local area with economic benefits. So further consideration to weigh into the balance. If I could at this point take you to your update sheet for this item. As a result of some queries, we have reviewed two of the conditions which you'll, you'll see on your agenda. The first is an employee cap. This, uh, this applies on condition two of item B2, that's the filming permission, and also condition nine, item B3, the driving experience days. Those conditions have a total employee, a cap on the total employee numbers. Now that cap has not been imposed on more recent permissions, such as a new settlement application, all the new business uses. Its main purpose is to control vehicle movements to the site. Given that that is controlled by other conditions, upon review, officers consider that condition is no longer justified and it is proposed that that be deleted from the relevant applications. Turning to the vehicle movements cap, it's a condition two on item B1, condition six on item B2 and condition seven on item B3, that should read. This doesn't change the overall number, but there was a slight suggested change to the monitoring submission of data, which is at the end. I actually have a further verbal update on that. We've had some recent, just a few moments ago, feedback from the applicants regarding the practicality of submitting records within the 14 days. It's important to know this is an additional requirement we had suggested over and above what those previous permissions required. What I suggested instead is that the, the end of that condition reads, the record shall be made available to the local planning authority on a six monthly basis. This is consistent with the current practice which is undertaken and is considered to work, to work successfully. With those changes in mind, I'll take you to the recommendations for the items. Recom First of all, turning to item B1, it is that permission be granted subject to conditions 1, 3, 16, 1, 3 to 16 on the agenda report and an amended condition 2. That is the highways condition which we just discussed. Similarly for item B2, the recommendation is the permission be granted subject to conditions 1, 3 to 5, 7 to 26 as on your agenda, re agenda report and amended condition 6 on this update. That again is that highways condition just referenced. And finally item B, for item B3, Again, the recommendation is to grant subject to conditions 1 to 6, 8, 10 to 12, and amended condition 7, that is the highways condition, on this update sheet. 
the, the recommendation for item B4 remains as set out on your agenda report that permission be granted subject to those conditions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rachel. Very thorough as usual. Thank you. Uh, members, Councillor Gray. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I did ask for this to be called in. Um, the reason being that I'm not against it in, in principle, um, but there are, is concern about the, uh, the approval of the hybrid application and potential noise, potential traffic impact during the construction phase. So I think it was worthwhile to bring it forward to, uh, to a committee and not just delegate it to officers. And uh, I would like to thank Rachel for her excellent report and also for um, addressing a number of queries that, that, that I've had on this application. I, two minor points. Um, Dunsfold is the closest point to the, the major noise area. Um, and as it says in the report on page 30, it's concentrated in the west. Um, I make that point because everyone assumes this is Oldfold, but actually Dunsfold is the, is the closest area. Um, one other point in the report, and I'm not asking for a change, but it refers to Compass Gate as a secondary access. I think that's a, a bad description. Um, I think both accesses are used and there are purposes. Um, obviously, HGVs are better access through, through Compass um, Gate in there, but there are two accesses at the moment rather than a principal and a, and a secondary. Um, Rachel's addressed a, a number of points that I've had on things like the employment. Um, I would sort of draw your attention to application B1 under condition 9. Um, I do believe that is an out-of-date monitoring reference. Um, it is corrected in, um, for example, condition 5 in B3, which talks about the updated 2005, and I think that, that should be amended. Um, just a, a point of consistency there. Um, we recognise that these extensions are not in contentious, but they are complicated. It's complicated in terms of the understanding the impact of previously approved applications on these. Um, noise monitoring and vehicle cap are very important to residents. Um, on the cap, when the new access construction is started, um, my understanding is the cap increases to 3,850. Now, it, it's difficult to turn around and say we're, we're increasing these um, to a, a previous level, but we know that they are going to increase again when the construction starts on the new access. When the new access is started, then we have a situation where effectively for the main application, there's no cap. And if there's no cap on the main application and for the main site, I would see that any cap under these applications would become not necessarily unenforceable, but they wouldn't necessarily be enforced because if you're not applying a cap to the site, then why should you be enforcing any of the caps under this application? Um, the suggestion in the report is the access road Construction will start in, Ju in July 2019 and it's to be completed, well, I'm assuming that it'll be by February 2020, which in the report says when the housing is expected to start. So, in fact, there will be no cap from February 2020 through to the end of the time limit of these applications, April 2021. As the cap is quite important, um, I think it's in my view at the moment that we should link the expiry of these applications to the start of housing. Um, I will wait to hear what my colleagues said, but I may want to come back and propose something on that. Um, if I could just mention B2, um, I'm grateful for clarification from Dunsville Park in terms of the use that, that B2 is put to. Um, and I don't have any problems on it other than it's going to be extended to June. Why isn't it brought back in line with the April date for the, for the other three? Um, that would be my comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you allow me to come back, I'd like to hear what 
other members have to say. Thank you. Councillor Dinas. Thank you, Chair. Um, we started off this evening talking about, uh, obviously, we've, we've got the application for the main um, village being um, approved and it's valid and lawful, and I think we all accept that. We all had different views when it came through to planning and possibly through the appeal process, but the result is the result. And it's important that we work with the applicants to make sure that the villages that are going to have quite a few years worth of lorries pounding the roads and pounding through the villages. So although the, the main application is being completed and approved, I think our work actually is only starting because we have to make sure we're absolutely spot on and do what's the right thing. Um, a couple of things, firstly, and my, my colleague's right, you know, though most of the, the, the application, the whole site sits within Unfold, some does sit within Dunsfold, and often the noise impact is probably is greater for Dunsfold. But I did notice in the consultation um, on page 21, Allfold has been consulted, but Dunsfold Parish doesn't appear to have been consulted. Um, and I think that's a real shame. Um, and I do think we, we can't turn the clock back on this one, but I would ask Elizabeth and, and Rachel for the future, for their benefit, you're only getting part of the story if you come to one parish. Um, but if I can turn to page 21, um, to Allfold Parish Council, um, I think it's a really important um, section, the second paragraph, and it says um, really where it starts requiring, so that's the third line down in the second paragraph, what they say it should be requiring that all track activity ceases upon implementation of, and then the planning reference, including construction of a new access road. And I actually think that's a very sensible suggestion. So as you start to build your new housing and your road, you're not then doubling up with having track events as well as all the, all the lorries. So I actually thought that was quite, quite a good, valid point. Um, highways, it's really interesting their terminology, but the full flying down would not have a severe impact. So I think we have to accept, unless it's a severe, it can be very, very bad, but if it doesn't get to their category of severe, it doesn't really matter, and I think that's quite a shame um, for, for local people. Um, again, I'm grateful that this was brought forward because I think it's right that the public see this is debated, and like my colleague, the principles of um, the events and everything else, I don't have a problem with. You know, they're established, um, it's part of the economy and everything, I don't have a problem with. I am concerned of all of those events overlapping when we've got lorries building construction roads and the start of the housing. That is my only concern. Um, and I think actually Elizabeth, when spoke right at the very beginning, said that the applicants want to continue pending the implementation of the plan. I think that was your terminology. Um, and, and I actually agree. You know, it's right. I have no objection then continue up until the implementation of the plan. But again, my only concern is the two overlap. We've got a three-year period being put on that, yet we're saying that the road's being built in 2019. There doesn't seem to be any reason why we're going for those dates. Personally, I think to have a date that it's clearly matched to when the road and the implementation of the main settlement commences, that to me would be a, a, a sensible suggestion. But again, like uh, Councillor Gray, I'll see what other people say and possibly I may want to come back, possibly I won't. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Doesn't look as if anybody else has got much to say about this, actually. So, uh, ah, Councillor Band. Thank you, Chairman, if I find the button to push. Um, yeah, I, I remember all these applications coming before us in, in the past, and I remember well the concern that uh, uh, members expressed uh, in relation to the, the cap of the movements. And one thing that I do recall was the importance of the reporting of these movements back on a regular basis. Now, 
I understood from what Rachel said, and maybe I misunderstood. Perhaps you can just clarify, yet again, the change to the uh, um, update sheet, because I would be very concerned if we were not able to get the data on a regular basis, on, 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 a, on a, an acceptable time. I remember before, we actually tried to get it well down below 14 days. We wanted it much less than that. But... It was important that we were able to demonstrate that these caps of movements were not being exceeded on a regular basis. So, uh, can, can you just clarify me once again exactly what is now being proposed? Because I'm not quite sure I fully understood, but I am, maybe I'm not happy with it. Rachel. Thank you very much. Yes, certainly help, helpful to clarify. I'll start by reading what the proposal is. The, pro the condition in your agenda report ended with the point where it says... Applicant is required to set down automatic traffic count systems or other appropriate measuring device at every vehicular access to provide evidence that the requirements of this condition are being met. This update sheet then provided an additional words, which I have since corrected, which would say the record shall be made available to the local planning authority, and the proposal is on a six monthly basis. Part of the logic behind this is we need to be able to build up from an enforcement perspective, if there was an issue to occur significantly, is we, need to, we would need to highlight that over quite a considerable period of time. A one-off issue on a one-week basis wouldn't give us a strong case for enforcement. Actually, looking at it over a six-monthly basis gives us a, a good picture of what, what the wider picture is and whether there is a fundamental issue. The other point to note is we have got quite a successful Dunstall Liaison Group where the applicants do sort of voluntarily put forward this information and data for us to monitor. So that's quite a successful mechanism, aside from what you've got on this permission, which is in place to monitor both other matters as well, but that includes vehicle movements to and from the site. So it's on a six-monthly basis, and the feeling is that that is an appropriate mechanism for which to monitor and build up a good wider picture of how that is developing. I hope that's helpful. Elizabeth, would you like to add to that? Thank you, Chairman. And just to add to that, I mean, many members present here do um, attend those informal meetings to observe the dialogue between officers and Dunsbold Park as applicants, which they attend voluntarily, to seek to support a transparent monitoring of these conditions. And there was a time 10 years ago, perhaps, where enforcement wasn't as effective as it is now and we used to receive a lot of concerns from local residents about activity on the aerodrome and these meetings have been put in place um, so that there can be an open conversation about concerns um, what they relate to the activities that are taking place and to allow us as officers to be confident that activity taking place on the aerodrome can find its its source in lawful development and a particular aspect of that is this monitoring process on the trip movements. And as I say, many members here do, do come to that meeting. And um, we are able to recognise from the data returns on that six monthly basis from Dunsfold Park that they are collecting the data of trip movements. And we're able to see the pattern of movements on a daily basis. And the importance, as Rachel has said, about it being a longer period than just even a week or certainly not daily is that for enforcement purposes, if we recognised over a, a period of time there was a material breach of the condition and the cap, we would have to be saying to Dunsfold, we're collecting data about a possible serving of a breach of condition notice, which we then have powers to follow up behind, possibly prosecute. Um, we've never been in that position because the data is submitted transparently and we're able to see that across the, the six monthly period there hasn't ever been a material breach of that condition. The only breaches occur perhaps on, on Wings of Wheels weekend where it's above it because of the, the considerable number of people visiting for that reason. That's a permitted development day and it's not caught by these temporary uses and the cap in any event. But um, most of the time the trip movements are notably below that limit, particularly since it's been raised following the employment permission of a couple of years ago. So I hope that gives you confidence, members, we are monitoring it, and this, this is really um, affirming up of that strong mechanism that we have in place now, um, that, that we will be able to insist on the data being um, submitted to us six monthly. At the moment, it is in any event, but this will give us an additional string to our bow. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Councillor Ban, did you wish to respond? Yeah. Um, well, I, I hear what you both say, but I, I still 
uncomfortable. I mean, I don't accept the argument that the six-month period gives you the data. I mean, you can always, if you were picking it up on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, you would still have the background to, to overlook the, what was happening. But uh, if it is working, perhaps I'll, I'll wait to hear what others say, because I, I, I just think it is too long to wait to see what is happening. Um, I personally would I, I accept that they may find 14 days is, is too short, but I'd have thought some, six months is, is too far to go, would be my personal view. But I, I, I wait to hear what others have to say before I go much further. I, I also, Chair, would be in favour of linking the, the, the cut-off date on this extension to some wording like the start of the construction of the housing, or whichever is the sooner. You know, you, you've got the dates. You know, the, I don't suggest we, we change the, 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 the three-year extension, but except to add some words, qualifying it, so it is li the, so it would they would this, these permissions would terminate, at, also would terminate at the point where construction of the housing schemes actually start. Not not the access. I think that's a separate issue. But I, I think uh, it's not unreasonable to, from my perspective, that they should terminate at that that point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think, uh, t to some extent, we were expecting that, that, that question, and obviously we looked very carefully at what the Parish Council raises in relation to these matters, and that's exactly what, what, what all fold are getting at, I think. Um, and, and we've very carefully considered the, the planning justification for such, such a link. The applicants clearly haven't offered it, so if we were to come to that conclusion, we would be imposing it on them without their agreement, and as with any planning decision, we would have to be very confident as planning authority that we have a sound, robust, defensible planning argument to insist on such a link. So on the face of it, it looks very convenient that one stops or use, temporary uses stop and the new settlement construction begins. But I would draw your attention, members, to um, our analysis on page 36 of your agenda where this very point has been explored um, and looked at very carefully. Um, and particularly, the, the third paragraph down under in combination effects draws your attention to the fact, as, as Rachel said in the presentation, that the environmental impact assessment, the comprehensive assessment of the impact of the new settlement, assumed as part of its base data that the temporary uses would still be in operation. So the impact of the new settlement, including its construction impact, is over and above the impact of those temporary uses. So, so what we're trying to say by linking it is that there would be an unacceptable impact of any overlap, i.e. a planning harm caused by any overlap in development. Now, if we impose that link and it went to appeal, we'd have to demonstrate to an inspector what we're getting at here, inspector, is a harm created by the overlap. And that inspector would say, but, but Dunsville Parker's applicants have done that analysis by factoring in the impact of the temporary uses, the noise, the visual impact, the traffic movements, into the assumption of what is there at the moment. And the impact of the new settlement is over and above that. And therefore, um, to that extent, there is no harm created or justified um, in terms of additional link by, by saying that the two will overlap. Um, it's comforting to note that, of course, as soon as the new settlement construction starts, be subject to a construction management plan, which itself will mitigate its own impact of the construction. Um, so, yes, the new settlement is acceptable in addition to the uses with mitigation, but that, that relevant mitigation for the construction will come in the form of the construction management plan. So it is a difficult one, and I, I do recognise the challenge there and the convenience of, of being very clear about it, but the, the planning argument is a very difficult one to make. And I think if you seek to impose that, that would be quite a difficult one for us to, to argue. So our conclusion is that they've asked for three years. Um, the impact will not, in the end, be material, even in conjunction with some construction activity. The uses remain controlled by the set of conditions that we're reimposing. And... Um, and mitigated, in, particularly in relation to the things that are already in place, for, for example, the noise management plan, which is run alongside the, the planning um, enforcement side. So that's why we've come to the conclusion that actually a link in, in time would not be defensible. But that, that's just our opinion to you. And I realise it's not an easy one, but thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you. Councillor Voroshevsky. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on, on the face of it, I was quite surprised that this did come before this committee because I look at the number of members in the room tonight who will all be claiming expenses and the officer's time and a report on something that seemed very simple and straightforward. And I, I stand by that. But I, I do acknowledge the concerns raised by the two ward members because it isn't as clear as it could possibly be. And I think Elizabeth has eloquently described there some of the sound, robust strategies that are in place to cope with those mechanisms should they not be adhered to. Um, they are, by virtue, temporary. Had there not been so many delays with the application that is not before us, then maybe we wouldn't be in this position we are this evening. But we have to realise that um, these conditions, these these um, businesses, they have been there for a number of years. The principle has been established. They need to continue in an operational sense until such time there's some um, action from um, the new development that will take place. Um, so on, on the basis of it, I think we have to look at the application in front of us, and it's asking us to um, consider looking at an extension to what's already established in, what's already established before us and that's what we should be looking at and concentrating on, although I do acknowledge this business of the crossover does cause, cause concerns. Um, so for me, um, it's straightforward, it's quite simple, although complex as Councillor Gray said because there's so many different facets to it. But we could sit here all night and debate it, but it's quite simple, it's quite straightforward. We're just asking for an extension, a temporary use extension to a business that's already on site that just needs to continue until such time a new development takes place. And as for um, caps and complaints, whilst I appreciate they are of some relevance, they're not relevant to what's here in front of us this evening. I'd be interested to hear um, from officers from the liaison groups, because I remember the liaison groups from um, years ago, um, what sort of um, complaints are being received at the moment, if any, with relation to the noise, because we talk about noise being an issue, but my understanding is, is that there are no complaints about noise as it is at the moment, and if there are, they're not comparable to the complaints that they used to receive years ago, so I can't see that being a reason for capping or looking at further complaints. Thank you, Chairman. And as I said, Chairman, if I don't make it um, because I have another engagement to go to. In my, I shall just discreetly go. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Seaborn. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm following up on, on the point that Councillor Ban made about the monitoring. I, th I think there's a degree of ambiguity in, in what we've got here in that the, uh, the initial proposed modification sheet was just asking for the right effectively asking for the right to ask for data. It wasn't actually asking for the data to be presented every two weeks. It just says the records shall be made available within 14 days of request. Now, we're, we're entering a phase at Dunsfold where things are probably going to be quite volatile in terms of amount of traffic generated. Um, the, 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 the six industrial units that we the six additional buildings that we uh, approved in 2015, for instance, those will be ramping up. There's going to be a lot of um, a lot of development going on as the uh, the residential uh, the road development starts and, and the residential development follows. Mm -hmm. And um, there's going to be concern expressed, not least by the um, the residents that I represent along the 281 and also in in Hascombe and, and Busbridge. Um, I drove back from Guildford this morning at 8.30 and the traffic was absolutely solid from the Guildford gyratory system to south of Bramley Infant School. This wasn't just the traffic jam to the mini roundabout in Bramley, it was actually solid the whole way. So when we start to see things like that, it would be very nice to go and inquire to see whether it is an impact of changing events at Dunsfold. But if, it, if there's, you know, things are steady state, then six months is probably absolutely fine. That establishes the pattern. But six months is actually quite a long time to wait if we suddenly start seeing unexplained patterns of traffic jams. So I, I'm inclined to, uh, to say, yes, we want the, uh, the six monthly regular data, but we would also like the right, as requested here, to see the data at shorter notice if changes in traffic movement are uh, become visible. Uh, as I say, I, it's very visible in Bramley that traffic has increased over the last two months, and uh, sorry, last two years. And one of the factors potentially is 
the you know, commercial developments at Dunsville. Lots of other factors potentially out there, but being able to actually say it's not Dunsfold would actually be very, very useful to everybody. It would maintain, um, maintain good relations. So uh, I would rather like to see the wording that is currently in the um, uh, amendment sheet maintained, not with the idea of wanting to see data every two weeks, absolutely not, but with the right to protect residents should changes become apparent during the course of the next three years. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I, the, the six months isn't noted anywhere in the condition, and it is simply that the record shall be made available within 14 days. So I, I think that sort of covers any investigation that we or, or the officers would wish to make, to my mind, um, which is basically what you're saying, I think. Rachel, sorry, did you wish to correct me? Or? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, it's just to clarify, I did make a verbal update to correct the update sheet. So for a sense where some of the confusion is arising, that suggested that... <laughs> rather than the, the 14-day period for submission at the six-month would be more appropriate. Thank you. I think Councillor Seaborn, you were suggesting that the 14 days would be preferable. Well, I think I'm rather yeah. suggesting we, we want both. We'd like to see data on a regular basis, which is what we're already getting. It would be nice to formalise that so that we, we get the clear pattern that is regularly demonstrated to us that there are not a significant number of breaches, but things are about to change. But... Equally, if we see things within a six-month period, we don't have to wait till the end of it to anal analyse and, and take action to stop it during a very volatile period in terms of activities at the site. So I, I think I'm, what I'm saying is actually both, both suggestions correctly worded would be good, one for a regular presentation of data and one for the right to see data at a shorter, uh, shorter interval should circumstances uh, suggest it necessary. Thank you. I think I would agree with you. Um, Councillor Gray, you're next on my list, but did you want to wait until other people have spoken? Councillor Goodridge uh, would like to join in the discussion, so I don't know if you want to... to I just wait. wanted to come back on the liaison group. and I mean, it has long been the view of the liaison group that six months is too long, um, and we have raised that with, uh, with, with the group. Um, the reason being that if you detect a pattern within six months, you've got... An, basically another six months to wait before you see the data, and it's, it's just too long. Um, I would mind it to agree with you that we should keep the regular six months, but there should be a right for, for this council to be able to call for the figures if they have a concern. Thank you. Councillor Goodrich. Chairman, if just covering that point first before I, I, I sort of say a few other things. I think the way it is on the um, update sheet is the correct wording. And we as a council and officers can, can have the flexibility then of deciding whether we'll ask that information monthly, three monthly, six monthly, or whenever there's a problem. And I wouldn't put three months or six months in at all. I'd just say 14 days of request, um, which then means that if things are getting a little um, fraught, uh, we, we might increase the time when we ask for the information. Uh, and I think it makes the wording simpler than 14 days on request and in any event every three months or four months or whatever. So that, that was my view. Uh, and talking about the overall figures, um, I, th I think it was Councillor Gray or it could have been Councillor Dinos mentioned that once the entrance roadway is started, the number of traffic movements increases from 3.4 to 3.8 in, in round terms. Uh, and therefore, the conditions we're putting on of 3.4 becomes a little meaningless if in a year's time or nine months' time, the entrance, uh, the, the, the access road is started. And I wonder whether... A, a, better wording would be three, four, whatever it is, or such figure that is uh, permitted under development number such and such uh, in its place so that you know, the whole thing is consistent throughout the period. I agree entirely that the overlap while building the access road and starting the housing 
is something which has already been taken into account, so it would be inappropriate to put that as a condition. But it does seem to me pretty obvious that once anybody lives in this development, they're not going to appreciate much cars racing around within a very short distance of them. And I, it may well be pie in the sky that any house will be occupied by the expiry date that are being sought. But I would put in or suggest and would ask the officers to consider whether we should say um, until the date's put in, and I agree it should be the same date, I can't see why we should keep different dates, but um, all such time as the first property is occupied. Um, because I think we could justify that on the basis, instead of the poor people in Dunsfold being upset, there's going to be people on the doorstep who are going to be upset. And it may be that the applicant would not wish <laughs> these conditions to go on once people are occupying the village, but the new village. But it seems to me we ought to at least go that far, because I, I, I don't know whether that's been taken into account on the uh, impact assessment for the big application, um, that it's fine to have uh, Top Gear or someone racing around while the people are actually living in those houses. Um, but, it, it, you know, who knows how much things will be delayed or not delayed or brought forward or whatever. So those are my initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, officers, would you like to respond to those points before Councillor Gray comes back? Thank you. Yes, I just make one, one interim comment, particularly about the prospect of the new settlement being implemented, potentially to a stage, as you say, of the houses being occupied and these uses continuing. Um, there's a few elements to that. We've got to consider the reasonableness and likeliness of that happening. First of all, there is a clear physical overlap between where the track is and the likelihood of where, whilst we don't know the exact location where the houses will go, Clearly, from a practical point of view, there's only so much they can, so far they can progress with those new houses before practically those uses of the track will need to stop. It's also worth considering that it's going to be very much in the applicant's interest to ensure that any future occupants of these houses are having satisfactory conditions, having phone calls every few minutes to say that these uses are causing a disturbance it isn't in their interest. But we do also have a further degree of of control I would point you to which is in connection with a new settlement there is a phasing condition on that which does give us a, a consideration of what's implemented and at what stage so that is a very point that we can have a look and review as to what stages are being implemented relative to existing uses on site um, we're looking at this very much as it is and without the reserve matters we do have a lack of certainty clearly whilst indications are given in the report as to when that will be put forward. So the officer recommendation is that that gives us sufficient control to monitor that. Also, we have the overarching concerns, of course, that our environmental health team do have statutory duties and powers to take enforcement action should, for any reason, those houses be implemented in an unreasonably close location to these track activities. We've got further safeguards there. So taking all that into account and the reasonable likelihood of that occurring, it's considered that will give us sufficient control to mitigate against against that possibility. I think probably, probably all for now on those questions. And if you've got anything else? Increasing when they start building, rather than having a blanket three, four. Thank you, Chairman, yes, come back on that. It, it is correct that clearly there is a potential that at some point when the permission becomes implemented that that cap will become almost meaningless. The purpose of constructing, constructing the, there's two stages, there's the construction of the access road and that is the point at which the cap increases. And beyond that, there's a further consideration because once the access road is completed and operational, then the cap ceases full stop because the transport improvements then would be such that it would not be necessary. Clearly, there's a, there's a consideration, I'll look to others for, for views on this as to whether or not, how we might word that in such a way. Clearly, if we leave it as it is, the option is there could be a potential breach at that point. We'd have to have a look and take a view. Likelihood is it wouldn't be reasonable to enforce. 
if the applicant wanted some additional comfort from us, it would be open to them to vary that specific condition to match up with the conditions on that consent. Um, so there's a few possibilities there. I'm not open to hear other suggestions on how we might amend that condition to address that. Uh, just coming back, Chairman, to Councillor Goodrich's question, precisely what would you like that condition to be re to include, just so we're clear? I was suggesting the figure that's in there, which is the 3-4, roughly. Yes. Uh, and then saying, uh, and it, it, if the uh, planning application, blah, 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 it starts to be implemented, then that figure shall rise to the figure contained in planning application 2015, uh, whatever the, the, new settlement the new settlement permission, permission so that um, we are linking the numbers yeah. on these temporaries to the same as the um, main application for housing. I mean, it just seems yes. silly to put a figure yeah. on knowing in maybe six months' time or yeah. eight months' time, it's meaningless. I, I mean... I, I, well, I think we've got some suggested wording to mop that up, Chairman. Steve's going to read it out. <laughs> it's not very long. Um, <laughs> essentially, all I would suggest is almost like a, um, a preamble to the wording of the condition that you've got on, on page one of your uh, update sheet is words along the lines of until such time as a development approved under and it's the big outline permission is implemented there shall be no more than da, 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 and on we go when it's implemented there'll either be the cap on the road element of it which is under the other permission and enforceable on the other permission right. or it falls away completely fine good makes more sense that's all great and the last question was, was there any reason why B2 couldn't uh, be finished on the 30th of April rather than the 1st of June? I, I think, Chairman, the answer to that is um, the applicants haven't requested that change. The permissions have been slightly out of sync with each other all this time. Um, you would be imposing that on them without understanding whether that's what they would prefer they probably wouldn't, but I can't guarantee. We're not in a position to have that conversation with the applicants here and now. My advice would be, yes, it would be tidier, but it doesn't really make much difference, and I think it would be better not to mess with it. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, are you happy with that, Councillor Good? Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Councillor Gray, did you wish to come back before we go to the vote? Yes. I've been listening uh, very carefully to what officers are saying about trying to link this uh, with an event. Um, I, I don't actually see that it's, it's that unreasonable because the, we have no idea what the phasing, we've got no details of the uh, final details of this. It's all got to be discussed. And I'm minded to think that if, if we've got all of these problems which we've been discussing, then what we should be having here is a two-year extension and not a three-year extension. It's that third year which goes here. Um, I understand what, uh, what Elizabeth and the officers are saying about imposing it on the applicant. Um, if that is a concern, the only, uh, the only option we've got is to defer it. And look at that, because either we want something in which basically says there the overlap, which we're not certain of in terms of housing, um, can come into effect, or we should really just say it's two years, because two years would take us up to the point in which it's suggested in here that we'd be starting housing. I mean, personally, I think maybe that won't be an issue, because maybe they won't have started the housing at that time, but we're speculating here. Elizabeth. Thank you, Chairman. I can only really come back to, to what I said earlier, that I think on the face of it, it's very attractive to have a very clean division and, and a link. But when you drill down and do the planning analysis, as I don't want to repeat everything I said before, but as we have done, that trying to make a case that the overlap would have significant planning impacts sufficient to control by condition um, does come with it the responsibility on us to demonstrate what those impacts are. And from what we've demonstrated through the report 
and taking into account what the environmental impact assessment did in terms of factoring in those temporary uses, um, th there isn't, in our view, a planning case to make to insist that one stops before the other starts. So I, I do realise the attraction of it. it, it it's, it's much more straightforward. But we have to be clear about what it is we're resisting here as a planning authority. And it, for all the reasons I said before, it would be a very difficult case to make. Um, I think in the end, and something um, Rachel alluded to, that a lot of this will unfold um, in any event in a natural way that, that because the development of the settlement will be phased in such a way to ensure that um, it's done in a logical way, it will enhance the sale of the properties, that the temporary uses will themselves, they can't obviously operate in the same place as the houses are going to be built. And from a, from a marketing point of view, um, the, um, the, the house builders will, want not, will not want unneighbourly um, temporary noisy uses carrying on in close proximity. So there will be a natural synergy there between the two things working together or not working together. Um, but um, I think they've asked for three years. I think if you're going to restrict them to two years, you really need to be able to make a very strong case that three years is unreasonable. And we haven't been able to find that case, I'm afraid, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has anybody else got anything they wish to add before we move to the recommendations? Councillor Gray. Can I come back and actually quote the officer's report, which says it, it's actually quite exceptional to extend a temporary uh, application anyway, and that's, that's in, in the report. So I don't, I don't think it's, uh, it, it's something in here. We're trying to find a compromise here. Been, I think it's fair that the applicant has a clear view as to what he can use it for and enter into discussions and negotiation with potential users of that field. And I'm very conscious of that. Um, I'm reluctant to turn around and say two years because um, it potentially limits, it changes it. But equally, we've been advised by you that we should not try and find a solution by linking it to housing. And I repeat what we said earlier, that the cap comes off once that access road has been built. Now, I think you, you know, I'm in a dilemma here because I, I listen to what, um, what the advice from officers is, they're saying that the, the EIS took this into account and effectively once that, uh, once that position comes, there is no CAF, there, is no, there are no controls that we can, we can apply. So maybe this, this temporary use should not extend beyond that point. And I I'm, I'm really am coming to the, the, the conclusion there is justification, and the justification is the uncertainty. There is no alternative. You can't turn around and try and modify this. We either accept the three years and, and with all the concerns we've got, or we cut it back and make it two years. But I don't think I can say any more on that at the moment. Thank you. Does there, any other member wish to contribute? Right, I think it's time to move. Sorry, Councillor Seaborn. Sorry, could, could officers just give us some clarity as to where we ended up on the, um, the monitoring uh, wording? What, what, what wording will we be actually asking for when we vote? Thank you. I think, as suggested by Councillor Goodridge, we reverted to the update sheet, which is the addition, additional sentence, the record shall be made available to the local planning authority within 14 days of request. And that the six months is irrelevant, really, if, if that's in there. Chairman, I think, I think our view remains that the six months would be the appropriate amendment um, for the reasons that we've, we've said, but we, we understand where you're coming from. I think uh, the, the reality of it is it may be that in imposing that and we get pressure to request the data, it may be practically Dunsfold are unable to provide it in um, the time frame that's anticipated, but that will remain a, a matter of discussion. And then at the end of the day, if they're not able to comply with it, it will be about the expediency of enforcing that condition. It's not very helpful, but that's what we're trying to get to, is, is a position which is clear-cut, reliable, enforceable, um, which basically the conditions need to be. So if, if, if you would like to revert back to that wording, it, it has to be on the basis that we don't think that's what Donsfold Park would welcome. Um, and that's why we moved away from that position, having had the chance to discuss it with them earlier today. 
but we would prefer the six months, but at the end of the day, it is, it is your judgment, of course. Thank you. I guess then, do we need an amendment or, or do, we, do I just amend the recommendation as I read it out to you? I, I think as it's on the update sheet, we, we could just take that route, couldn't we? So if we take the recommendations one at a time, the first one is uh, B1, WA 2018 0170. Um, now this has the additional condition which had the um, the preceding sentence which was suggested by Steve Weaver uh, connecting it with the, the major development and uh, the additional uh, sentence at the end the record shall be made available to the local planning authority within 14 days of request and the recommendation is that permission be granted subjects uh, to conditions 1, 3 to 16 as set out in the agenda report and amended condition 2 with the uh, alterations that I've just suggested. Could I have all those in favour, please? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those against? Abstentions. Abstentions. Three. Thank you. So that uh, recommendation is carried. The next recommendation is B2 WA 2018 0171, that permission be granted subject to conditions. 1, 3 to 5, 7 to 26, as set out in the agenda report, and the amended condition 6, as on the update sheet, condition 2 is deleted. All those in favour? Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And those against? Abstentions. Four. That recommendation is carried. Uh, Revised recommendation B3 WA 2018 0172 that permission be granted subject to conditions 1 to 6, condition 8, conditions 10 to 12 and amended condition 7 on, this, on the update sheet. Condition 9 is deleted. Uh, all those in favour, please. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Against? None. Abstentions? Three. There's a pattern emerging here. Um, that is also carried. And then finally, uh, item B4, which must be WA 2018-0173, that's subject to conditions 1 to 6 and informatives 1 to 3, permission be granted. All those in favour? 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, it's unanimous. <laughs> that's unanimous and that is carried. Thank you very much, members. Uh, thank you for your time. We have no other items to discuss, so uh, the meeting is closed. <laughs>